All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Yeah, so it's still news up first day. Uh, it's that time where we delve into our conversation. But just to let you know, my pairing partner, which no money is, uh, is back in the studio. Wilson, good morning. Good morning, David. Good morning. Um, interesting stories this morning, and uh, definitely looking forward to what you know, we'll be discussing on the show today. Mm, fantastic. Uh, you, you missed the paper review segment. Right? Yes, so, uh, but you so, know, the, so, the, so the exciting news. Exciting stories that you, you, I would have wanted to, to hear uh, <laughs> your, your perspective. To, the first lady's to, visit to oh, the yes. National Assembly definitely dominated the headlines. And, Very true. And so we're looking Very forward true. to more of those from her because we haven't seen her in a while. <laughs> oh, okay, fantastic. Okay, well, it's that time. Let's, let's, let's dive into our next conversation. We're looking at um, constitution amendment, uh, examining the, pro the process and implication. Of course, we all understand that um, it has been, it seemed like uh, an Aquilian tax task in Nigeria to have our constitution fully amended. The process, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, seems to be quite a cool uh, uh, The process of a um, two-third majority from the, the legislators and then the houses of assembly uh, and all of that. But then let's, let's speak with the experts. Um, let's get clarity as, as to the process in um, amending our constitution. We've been joined by uh, OK. Oh, is it okay? Okay, okay, up here. Okay, okay, up here. Yes, I hope I got that right. Okay, up here. He's an executive director, order paper. Uh, he joined us from our Buja studio. Oh, okay. Uh, so good to have you join us on the news up. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Please correct me uh, with the name. Is it okay? Uh, it's going to be a continuous struggle. It's a short uh, letter name, you know, but I have to deal with this many of the times. Okay, API is the name. Okay, okay, we'll stay with that. Uh, okay, mm. okay, we'll, we'll stay mm. with that. Fantastic. L let's let's look at the process, uh, uh, the process so far. Uh, let let me start off with um, what is going now at the National Assembly right now in terms of um, uh, 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 the opening conversations around the um, constitution review um, amendment. Yes, uh, what, what would be your take on that? Well, um, we, we have um, come to a stage in the constitutional amendment process that is very critical and requires um, uh, the participation participation of all citizens and um, and groups as we as we have them um, this stage is uh, what we may say is like crossing the rubicon they are going to be taking votes on the constitution uh, provisions uh, next week you know and so this is where we need the uh, the vigilance the alacrity you know and public pressure by citizens to see that our lawmakers you know, responds and act according to the yearnings and aspirations of their constituents, of citizens and Nigerians generally. Um, I, you know, your opening remarks, you were talking about, um, try to talk about the processes of um, amending the constitution. How did we get to where we are now? I mean, that's a very critical question that you have raised. You know, unfortunately, um, we have not invested. And when I say we, I mean, you know, uh, the institution of the National Assembly, uh, to some extent, the media, uh, to some extent, um, civil society groups, you know, citizens generally have not invested sufficient um, energy and attention uh, in this very important process, in indeed, uh, because this has to do with the ground norm of the country, the basic law that binds all of us as Nigerians uh, in different parts of the country. And if there are going to be changes to this very basic uh, ground norm, then we ought to be very much interested. We ought to be quite conscientized and sensitized in all of the processes, uh, you know, and the requirements that this process would go through. Unfortunately, we haven't seen much of that. I mean, in my organization at other people, we have tried our uh, little best to try to uh, keep raising the awareness and sensitization. You know, uh, I would say that the National Assembly has falling below expectations in trying to engage with the citizens, in trying to engage with their constituents in this very important process, you know. Uh, but if you don't mind, uh, uh, no need, you know, sharing blames. I could run through the processes, you know, very quickly so that Nigerians know and understand uh, how we got to where we are and what are the next steps are going forward, you know. Uh, but my general and opening comment will be that Nigerians need to be more than ever before 
uh, become very alert, become very vigilant, and become aware and understand the provisions. I think 68 of them are uh, 68 proposals that have been, you know, uh, laid in the floor, on the floor of the Senate as at, uh, and the National Assembly, indeed, the House of Representatives, uh, 68, you know, uh, proposals to amend the Constitution. Uh, that's quite a number. You know, how many uh, of these numbers are Nigerians are aware of? What are these provisions? What do they contain? You know, uh, it's very important that in the coming days and coming weeks, Nigerians are very much sensitized and conscientized on all of these provisions or most of these provisions and ensure that their representatives in parliament, you know, uh, do the right thing. Okay, let's look at the uh, the visit of the First Lady now. Her, her presence there was to show support and solidarity for the inclusion of women in governance. Um, one of the clauses that is said to be amended is making provisions for 37 senatorial slots for women. But many would wonder how this can actually be made possible. Are they? Uh, is this going to mean that if a man is to contest for office, he would not be given the seat? Or is this to boost, you know, the number of participation of women at each political party's elections leading to the senatorial elections? Um, Nigerians are not quite clear on what this implication actually means. And the presence of the First Lady there in the first place. Do you think that this is the way to go for us to have more women inclusion in governance? I mean, there is no doubt that we need uh, more, uh, we need um, inclusion in governance, including gender inclusion. Um, and so it is quite uh, remarkable that we had um, uh, the wife of the president show up in parliament yesterday. Uh, that sends a very strong message uh, in terms of advocacy uh, that this is very key, you know, uh, to Nigerians, that this is very key. Uh, you, you know, uh, to the political evolution of the country, you know. Uh, so that symbolic, you know, visit is, is, I mean, the first of its kind. And I, I would like to commend the wife of the president for taking that step. You know, I think it gives a lot of Philip to the advocacy uh, for gender inclusion, you know, in political leadership in this country. You know, but then uh, that is what it is. Uh, the key issues there are, uh, you know, you, you, you try to raise them. You try to raise posers around them. You know, uh, that particular provision, you know, uh, is, is that the way to go? Is that what we currently require in this country? Um, yes, you know, it's debatable. Uh, we all agree. And I very, very much, I mean, I'm a champion of gender inclusion, you know, uh, we have to either look at the practicability or feasibility of uh, that kind of proposal. Um, you, it seeks to create um, exclusive additional 111 seats for women in the National Assembly. So you would have, um, uh, in the Senate, you would have um, an additional seat exclusively created you know, for women uh, from each of the states of the country and the federal capital territory. That makes it 37. You know, and for the House of Representatives, you have two additional seats uh, created uh, exclusively for women uh, from each of the 36 states uh, and, of course, the, the FCT. So, uh, and then, you know, that would make up the numbers, you know, to about um, 111 additional seats, you know, uh, to join with the 469 seats that we currently have. I think it sounds plausible. It's, it's, it seems like a novel, you know, radical approach to disrupt uh, the system that has held against um, inclusion, gender inclusion in the country. But the question, the key question is, is it practicable? Is, is, is that the way to go at the moment? You know, uh, if we sincerely analyze this issue, perhaps we would, we would uh, be, be deploying our resources and our energies uh, in some other ways to get at it. I, I know that there's also a bill on gender uh, proposal, you know, on, in this condition amendment process, they are seeking to 35% uh, affirmative action for political parties. You know, uh, that is also novel. I mean, that is also great. That could be an incremental way uh, to look at uh, gender inclusion in political leadership in this country. You know, I, I am raising these issues not because I am, you know, directly against the bill. I am raising this issue against the background of its practicability 
in um, in an era where we are already hard pressed with respect to you know um, the cost of governance. You know, uh, should we be you know increasing the size of parliaments in an era where we are you know uh, pressed with um, you know resources to run the economy and the country? Should we be you know having more seats created for politicians? And mind you, I mean, the, 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 the proposal also states clearly that it's, it does not stop women from also, you know, seeking or contesting to occupy, you know, uh, existing seats in parliament, you know, and that uh, this will be an experiment for 16 years if it stays through after this current National Assembly, and then it will be reviewed after 16 years, you know. So that's a caveat that is quite, um, you know, attractive, you know. Uh, but we must look at this provision vision, uh, this proposal very holistically to be sure that um, uh, we are not cutting our nose to spite our face. Let me throw you back to another reason, give you another reason why I'm raising this proposal. Um, last year, we had um, the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill thrown out or stepped down, so to speak, in the yeah. Senate of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I mean, the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill, it speaks, in my view, more holistically uh, to gender inclusion, uh, you know, than political participation, you know, just the prism of political leadership, which the uh, additional seats for parliament, uh, for women, you know, parliamentarians uh, yeah. seek to achieve, you know, because that goes across, you know, uh, the polity, uh, the economy, gender inclusion across board, you know, but we couldn't get that bill to see the light of day in the Senate, uh, because very much of because of the same issues that have militated okay. against the, the, the issues okay. of um, okay. 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 The, the kind of society. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, whilst we're waiting, whilst we're waiting to see if uh, the bill will see the light of day, I I'm also thinking: uh, Can't we initiate this from from the party party constitutions? Uh, maybe from the parties, if the parties uh, could have a buy-in into the fact that they need um, women inclusion uh, in governance. So, from the party level, primary levels, the party says for every of our elections, for every of our, our nominees, we're going to have 35% women representat representation in all of that. Uh, maybe that will solve the whole problem rather than going through uh, uh, the Senate waiting for, for, for the, gender, the gender bill uh, to be passed. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think I'd agree with you. And that's the point I was making about going through this an incremental basis, uh, going through where we would probably have less resistance, you know. But unfortunately, the politicians appear to uh, think more about themselves, appear to be more concerned about their interests than the interest of the generality of the rest of us, and sometimes the country. You know, I, I did mention, even though I have not seen all of the base, all of the details of the 68 proposal that have been put uh, laid on the floor of parliament, but I did, I, I know that there is one that relates to um, 35% affirmation uh, with respect to political parties. And so I, it will be fair and it will make a lot more sense to deploy more attention, energy, and resources into seeing the proposal pass through. Because from the nomination stages of political parties, you know, it proceeds to uh, the general elections. So if political parties make this uh, a mandatory uh, requirement or inclusion, gender inclusion for certain seats or certain positions to be reserved uh, for, for women, uh, then it naturally would go through at the general elections, you know. But you see, politicians are what they are. They would rather want to extend, increase, or expand the space, you know, so that you have more people coming uh, rather than at the party level you know, limits, uh, you know, the opportunities, you know, for, in, for participation, the opportunities, you know, to become relevant, the opportunities to get elected. So I agree with you in my view, uh, that would be uh, one way to go about it. At the political party level, uh, there should be a, a, a greater attention paid to inclusion, gender inclusion, rather than taking it forward and taking it up to, you know, uh, the general election level where, we will not only be increasing the cost of governance, we will also be uh, left with the choice of, um, you know, uh, mandatory elections. You know, what I mean by that is that, okay, we'll have to elect whether or not um, the candidates presented, you know, for election uh, quite uh, deserve to be elected into office. That, you know, that, because that's, a that's a valid point. Parties are what they are. 
Okay, that's a valid point. Uh, but, you know, I, I was listening to um, snippets from the plenary sessions yesterday, and I heard um, Ahmed Wase say that there will be a lot of lobbying uh, before the bills can be made law. I'm sure this lobbying will be amongst those within the legislative arm and, of course, others that are affected between the executive and other parts of the country. One of such areas is the value-added tax controversy. Now, we know that the current law has been challenged to the court, uh, where River State actually took the federal government to the court of law and won that case in the federal high court. Um, what we are seeing, one of the amendments that will be made, will allow for the federal government to have more, should I say, control over the value-added tax for Nigerians and, of course, all states of the Federation. Uh, what do you make of this, especially when people are wondering, in this day and age where we have seen, uh, you know, poor management of resources at federal level, should we now continue to extend the capacity of the federal level to generate revenue from the states and, you know, try and cater for the needs of the state rather than letting the states go ahead and do what they need to do themselves? I am happy that you have raised this point, and this is one of the reasons that reinforces my earlier view that Nigerians ought to be very vigilant and, and become aware of what these provisions are and know what to stand for, know what to demand that their elected representatives in parliament vote for or against. You know, um, amending the constitution is a very important and serious business. It's something that uh, restructures in a way, and I use the word advisedly, you know, because they, they, they talk about restructuring you know, uh, has gained, you know, currency over the months, over the years, and, you know. So if we're not able to sit together and do a wholesale restructuring by way of a national conference, by way of, um, you know, referendum and all of that, that, you know, some have canvassed. So the constitutional amendment process provides a means, a basis, a window, you know, to achieve some of the, you know, advocacies around restructuring, political restructuring, economic restructuring, whatever kind of restructuring, you know, in spite of the controversies that have been thrown around it. You know, so fiscal federalism is one of the issues that have been raised around restructuring. And I'm happy that you have brought this up, you know, because uh, the issue of value added tax, you know, recently has become quite controversial. And, you know, it's also a matter before the judiciary, you know, um, and um, uh, we know that why that matter was uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, in the public domain, there were, you know, reports that, um, you know, uh, moves had been made to amend or being made to put it as a constitutional amendment provision uh, so that um, it could, it could uh, maybe sidestep the judiciary process or overturn it if, in case that goes through. Because if the constitution gets amended and its provision says through, it doesn't matter what the outcome of uh, the judicial process at the end of the day. You know, so in trying to devolve, you know, uh, financial autonomy to the states, to the subnationals, uh, is this the way to go? You know, so for advocates of fiscal federalism, this particular provision should be of interest. And if it's something that we think is antithetical, you know, to our progress, respect to devolution of powers, respect to fiscal federalism, then we have to mobilize citizens to put pressure on members of the National Assembly to vote against it, you know, because this is, in my opinion, this is not the way to go. You know, and that's the point I speak about earlier. You know, politicians tend to be more interested in pursuing their own narrow interests without sometimes looking at the overriding national interest, looking at the overriding interest of their constituents. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, so this is just one provision, you know, because the political party in power, you know, appears, no, not appears, the political party in power has seen this, you know, uh, you, you know, their position on this VAT issue is to make it a federal affair. So this bill to retain VAT or to make VAT clear solely in their exclusive legislative yes. list yeah. is an agenda. It's a program of the party in power. And, you know, I mean, they control both the executive and the National Assembly where they have a, you know, a comfortable majority. Yes. You know, but you is know. this the way to go? Well, okay. With respect okay. to uh, fiscal federalism and devolution of powers. Okay, we, we, see, we seem to be in a quagmire as a people and as a nation uh, when we look at uh, the, the document that seems to, uh, you know, decide uh, 
what we do as a people and how we do it and who gets what and who gets who doesn't get what. Uh, because I, I'm, I'm listening to you right now and I'm, I'm thinking, when you talked about uh, people's participation, uh, you could even see that even the document that allows people's participation is skewed towards not allowing them to participate. Um, I, I'll give you an instance. The whole concept of um, recalling a, um, a representative, you know how Aculean that task could be to have um, uh, someone that represents my constituency recalled uh, by his constituents. You know, that in itself is a huge challenge. So we see this document as um, uh, one that um, deliberately, intentionally, uh, you know, uh, makes it difficult for, for people's participation. That, for me, is a, ma is a major concern here. I agree with you. Uh, and that's the point I, I, I keep making, you know, in earlier comments. That's, you know, irrespective of, you know, um, uh, maybe not opacity, irrespective of the inadequate, you know, sensitization around the conscious amendment process, uh, conscious efforts must be made. And that's why, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a good thing that you're discussing this matter on your show this morning. I mean, I, because at least Nigerians watching would have, you know, a sense of what is going on. Uh, you know, the National Assembly has a provision for the constitutional amendments, uh, you know. And part of this provision or expectation is that they would engage citizens, they would engage their constituents, you know, and break down these issues to their understanding so that they can be able to make advised judgment and say, look, yes, we elected you. Now you want to go vote on these issues. But this is what we want, and this is what we want you to vote for or against. Then we haven't seen that happen. We haven't seen much of that happen. We know that they've had, uh, they had um, the zona hearings. Um, right. I think oh. we may have lost yes, uh, we'll uh, contact. Yes, contact with our Abuja studio. We hope to get that back. Participation has been okay. very, I very nice. It's back now. It's back. Yes. Sign, uh, to us. No. Uh, sorry, okay. I think we lost contact there a while ago with you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, Wilson. Well, no problem. Well, uh, you know, okay, there are, there are quite a lot of things for us to examine in this bill. As we said, there are 68 clauses that are looking to be amended. Um, we have touched on a few that I think are important. But one of the places that may skew to us the states is um, the ownership of airports and, of course, rail stations. This is, many would say, is very important if the nation is to actually develop in its transportation sector. Uh, what do you make of this? And um, also then we begin to look at, you know, the entirety of the process, which, which cost quite a lot of millions of Naira for each senator and each out of rep member to go to their different constituents and actually, you know, get their people to bring proposals, then take it back to the National Assembly. Many would have thought, why don't you do this for a new constitution than, than you know, make amendments that will be lobbied back and forth against what you know the senate president was saying that you know let's keep the current constitution and just make amendments let's start off with um, the ownership of railway and airports okay go ahead these are very broad areas that you have raised i'll try my best to address them um I, again you know uh, which the, the the objective or one of the objectives of the current or what the constitutional amendment process generally is to achieve, you know, social political engineering and some bit of some economic reset for the country. And you know, I talked about fiscal federalism and devolution of powers earlier. You know, so uh, the proposal, you know, uh, to remove um, uh, railways and airports, and I think even energy, you know, uh, power from the exclusive legislative list and also devolve it to uh, the subnationals. I think it's a commendable one. It's one thing that uh, would boldly address the issues around um, developments, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, social infrastructure around, especially with respect to power. We, got, we have seen situations where uh, some state governments invested huge amounts of resources, you know, in building, you know, power plants, independent power stations, and all of that. You know, but we, it, ironically, we haven't seen this benefit people of those states because, you know, uh, it's, it's an exclusive matter. It's a matter on the exclusive legislative list. So you are able to make all those investments. You are not able to see that uh, 
it gets to the benefits, it gets to benefit your citizens uh, as a state government. You know, so uh, moving that item away from the exclusive list uh, to uh, the concurrent list so that, uh, you know, um, those who make such investments are also able to direct, you know, uh, the application of those investments for the benefits of their citizens would make a lot of sense. You know, uh, we have seen how many state governments, you know, have built airports or struggle, some are struggling to build airports, whether it is viable or not, whether it is of relevance or not. But we have seen all of this. So they like pretty much build this infrastructure and hand it over to federal authorities, you know, who very much determine, you know, uh, how these things not just are run, that revenues from this, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and all of that. So all of these investments by subnational governments uh, do not tend to bring benefits to their citizens, you know, do not tend to address the ownership question with respect to this infrastructure. So uh, these are bold initiatives that have been proposed in the current constitutional amendment uh, uh, pro proposals. And I, I'd like to commend the National Assembly uh, uh, for going that route. You know, the other question uh, about, um, um, if you don't mind, you need to remind me again. Um, what was the other question, please, again? The, the, I was talking about the broadness of these amendments that we saw. It took almost six months, there about, for each senator to go to their different constituents and also get feedbacks and allow people to make proposals for amendments of the Constitution. And then they submitting it back to the House, where there were lots of back and forth arguments before all of this were actually tabled together to make the 68. Uh, many would have been wondering that, you know, Nigerians have been clamoring for more inclusion, you know, a separation of power, um, also a review of the Constitution, a restructuring of the country as a whole. But, you know, the Senate leader, um, when he spoke during the, the Ember months, I think during December when he was at the uh, Asso Rock, said that, you know, the 1999 Constitution is what we have. And so we should, we should try and keep amending it till we get what we want. Do you think it is more cost efficient for us to go through these amendments than for us to go actually have a proper thorough sit down looking at the entire constitution and having something that brings inclusion for all Nigerians? Uh, there are issues of cost and practicability uh, related to this question. You know, and uh, I mind you had mentioned earlier the uh, agitations for restructuring, the agitations for a reset of the political system in my earlier comments. And this speaks to, I think, the point that you are making about instead of making these piecemeal amendments, mind you, the constitutional amendment has become like a routine for the National Assembly almost since 1999. We've seen each uh, uh, assembly, you know, uh, uh, make this a, a key uh, function or a key responsibility where they set up um, uh, at inception a stand, sorry, an ad hoc committee, a special ad hoc committee in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. And I tell you, huge amounts of money, uh, you know, are voted for these purposes by the National Assembly. At least a billion naira is voted, uh, you know, for this work, you know, uh, you know, to go on each time there is a new National Assembly. So from uh, you make the do the maths yourself. You see, from you know when we started this process, you know up until now, how many assemblies have we had? You see the amounts of money uh, that have gone through the process. As it, how much of it has it achieved for us? How many provisions of the constitution have, have we been able to amend? You know, uh, if we had, had a, a, a you know a confab as it were, or something of that nature, and we have uh, a constituent assembly seat and discuss what we need and discuss how we want to live together, how we want to be governed as a people, what should bind us together, what should be the uh, directed principles of state, and we own a constitution, a document that we can say, this is really autochthonous, this belongs to the people, this issued from the people, you know, perhaps that would have cost less, you know. But again, the argument has been that the constitution itself, which, you know, was promulgated in 1999, made provisions for how we can have an amendment, made provisions for how we can even have a new, uh, you didn't make provisions uh, for a whole save, you know, uh, 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 a replacement of the current framework. But you see, these are socio-political engineering that could happen. Like I've said to you uh, more than once on this program, uh, politicians tend to be more interested in promoting, you know, their narrow pr prisms, you know, and look, you know, not very much look beyond uh, uh, their own, uh, you know, uh, interest. You know, if we have had a lot of statesmen, you know, in 
leadership, in political leadership, perhaps we would have been able to look at this. You know, we've had um, the, the, the past national conferences where there have been holistic discussions, very well, you know, uh, sufficient uh, representation across the country, you know, beautiful recommendations. What happened to all of those? You know, um, the argument is that the National Assembly is vested with the power to make these amendments, to propose these amendments. And of course, as provided for in Section 9 of the document of the 1999 Constitution amended, you know, the president has to assent to these proposals before we have these amendments. So we've not had a lot of amendments going on. Uh, the question about having a wholesale document continues to rage, you know, because, you know, the priority of the political class, as we currently have it, is not sometimes or if not almost all the time in sync with the aspirations of citizens the aspirations of the constituents that they uh, that they represent so the question about participation continues to ring through it continues to be a major factor you know in determining and you know let me ask you i, I don't know if you had you know meetings or you had or you attended meetings or you heard of meetings convened by your representatives either in the senate or in the house of representatives <laughs> you know during this process this last six months that you talk about where they had these issues discussed say, look these are the provisions that we are considering in yes. parliament what do you guys know about it this is what you should know about it this is what uh, how do you want us to vote about this yeah. you know many of these things i'm sure or much of these things i'm sure did not happen so there's been this this you know nagging issue about inadequate insufficient participation of the citizens you, nigerians, you, are, not okay, okay, nigerians that, are not conscientized okay nigerians are not fully aware that, of that for me that's that for me would be the place for my next question because um, in the heart of this should be uh, people's participation and um, everything like I did say is skewed towards deliberately, deliberately, uh, you know, disenfranchising Nigerians from from these decision making processes. What can we be doing as a people? Because that's the essence of all of this. What can we as a people be doing? What can we? What can we do? What should we do uh, to to whether uh, what's the word now? Uh, you know, impress impress on these lawmakers to ensure that indeed that we are part of this decision making are going forward. Okay. Great question. Uh, we are already where we are. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot move the hand of the clock back. So we are at a critical junction, like I said earlier, where we have um, to have members of the National Assembly make a vote on each of these 68 items that have been proposed, you know, as laid in the reports in National Assembly uh, yesterday. Uh, so we have missed moments about uh, much of the conscientization much of the sensitization on these issues that should have happened. And of course, I had tried to share the blames and I didn't want to dwell much on that. But where we are, we can still do something as citizens, as constituents, as Nigerians. Uh, I mean, we elected these representatives. They, they represent us in parliament. They owe us a duty you know to also make us understand however that would happen you know uh, it could happen even through i mean uh, we, we can demand that we can ask them you know uh, we, we, uh, we can ask them through phone calls we can ask them through social media we can ask them by writing letters we can ask them we can put some pressure say look now you have provisions in the current proposals, you know, that are outlandish, provisions that are, do not speak to the uh, well-being and aspirations of Nigerians. I, I, I give you a few. Why does the, the leadership of the National Assembly uh, think that this is the best time to have pensions uh, for, its, for, for its set? You life pensions after office. Why do you want to have life, life pensions for yes. the president of the Senate? For the president, the deputy president of the Senate, for the speaker of the House Chris of Representatives, <laughs> for the deputy yes. speaker of the House of Representatives. <laughs> I mean, in an era, in an age, in a period where we know that the cost of governance, uh, we're actually looking at how we can reduce, you know, the structure, the size of governments, and increase or decrease the cost of governance. You know, uh, don't forget that that the issue of pensions have become uh, a great issue of advocacy. You know, bearing in mind that some members of the National Assembly currently earn pensions from their previous uh, uh, jobs in political offices. So if those actually not become, you know, presiding officers as you have them, they will be, I mean, I would, would you be having, you know, double pensions for them? You know, so uh, Nigerians are getting really impatient with this kind of, um, you know, inclination by politicians to think more about themselves and care less about them. You know, um, why is it that there is no, you know, um, 
why I did not have any provision, and I haven't seen that I stand to be corrected. Uh, that makes uh, the chapter four the constitution justiciable. In chapter four of the constitution, which speaks to you know uh, um, fundamental services, you know, and directive principles of states, you know, uh, which is by the way flagrantly ignored and you know violated by you know political leadership. Why do we not make that justiciable so that people can go to court, citizens can go to court and say, look, my human rights, uh, my rights to housing, my rights to uh, to education, you know, my rights to uh, uh economic welfare and environment and all of this is being violated and i need redress and i need them um, i need this to be protected so these are just beautiful process uh, pieces of um uh you know uh, you know submissions in the constitution but they are of no value because they are not justiciable why do we not see that right. you know um why are we more interested you know as members of the political class that they are you know, in advancing their own interests. Why do we have a bill, you know, as offensive as immunity, <laughs> extension of immunity? You, 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 you've touched on a, very, on, on a very strong point of this amendment. And um, yes, it, it's, quite, it's quite laudable that, you know, there are some bills that will improve the lives of Nigerians, but there are also others which may improve the lives of those that are currently in office. But one thing that will definitely help Nigerians, you know, progress further is a dissolution of powers and of course the the ensuring ensurement that you know the judiciary has its own autonomy to finances and that is one of the provisions being proposed but we know that this bill in being in existence is not a guarantee that it will actually scale through all of the processes before it becomes law how critical do you think it is for the judiciary to have its autonomy of course financially where many people still feel that like there's a lot of control from both the federal and state governments on what happens within the judicial system indeed i mean that's one of the key the desirables of um, the advocacy for uh, restructuring uh, that we have been, you know, discussing, uh, debating in this country for a while. Um, that you have the legislature at the subnational level uh, that is no more than an appendage of the executive. You know, uh, in some states it's so bad that it is a department of the office of the governor. We can very much, very well describe it as such. You know, and that's because there is no independence, and that's because there is no autonomy, and that's because they don't have access to funds, and you know, funds that are due to them. You know, financial autonomy is not there, and this is one critical area, unfortunately. Uh, that I see that in the proposals that have been presented. You know, I, I think that that is one area that we should push for to see that is sales through. Of course, bear in mind that this is not the first time that this this will be coming up. I have said to you earlier that. You know, these proposals, some of these proposals are not entirely new. They've come up repeatedly in past assemblies. You know, they have been repeated. Some of them have been passed. Some of them were not assented to. You know, I, I, in the eighth assembly, just the previous assembly, uh, the preceding, you know, assembly, for instance, they, uh, they had 15, 15 clauses, 15 proposals that were passed, you know, uh, by that assembly in four years, you know. Uh, five of them were assented to, you know, and uh, 10 of them, you know, some of those issues have come up again in the current amendments. You know, and by the way, talking about the time, so one thing that we must say to this current National Assembly is that they have been quite tardy and they are delayed in this amendment process. Um, this is 2022, and we are just about in the process of voting, you know, uh, from um, uh, the National Assembly or at the National Assembly. So. The next process would be to take the voted the, the proposals that say through after the vote into the state houses of assembly because that is a critical in fact one of the most critical components of the process because at least 24 two thirds of the states as of houses of assembly of the country you know must concur with the uh the, the votes made at the national assembly for any provision indeed to be deemed to have been passed by the legislature before it is transmitted to Mr. President for his assent, you know. So uh, that they have prolonged the process onto this time, 2022, where we're now in the middle of an election, you know, the election fever is already palpable, you know, the transition is almost afoot already. Uh, this is going to color, this is going to affect a whole lot of, you know, uh, the outcomes of the current process. Uh, if you relate this to what happened in the Eighth Assembly, by this time in the Eighth Assembly, they already had their base packed. I think they already had the proposals before Mr. President for his assent. Because I recall that it was in 2017 
uh, that they had this vote taken. They had them, um, you know, the, uh, I think by 2017 or thereabouts or 2018, the president already had, was, was set, was set to deal with these issues. And by 2018, he had already assented to some of the bills. I recall that the not too young to run bill, the one that reduced the age, age uh, limits for political office orders, uh, was assented to in May 2018. You know, so this assembly has put dragged on this issue. They ought to have moved beyond where they are currently because, you know, uh, we have less than a year to have all of this process, go to the state assemblies, come back, you know, and, you know, prepare it and transmit to the president for assent. And you know that this Mr. President, current Mr. President, it has not been very enthusiastic, you know, with respect to uh, speedy attention to bees from the National Assembly. You know what's going on with the Electoral Act Amendment Bill, for instance. You know, so uh, this delay certainly would impact on the process. You know, but, and like I said, we are already where we are. Like, can we, what is the best way to make, what is the best we can make out of this? The best we can do is to speedily increase the sensitization, the awareness, you know, uh, the understanding around these proposals. Let Nigerians know what they are. Let Nigerians know the implications of what a vote, a yes vote will mean, of what a no vote will mean. And use that judgment, that understanding to put pressure on their legislators to say, look, we want this to say through. We want railway to be devolved mm. from the exclusive legislative mm -hmm. list to the concurrent list. Mm -hmm. We want air force. We want police. energy. No, but we don't want you to have life pensions, or we don't it's want it's you it's to have immunity as the deciding of officers of the National Assembly. Sort of you know, so these are the understanding. Yeah. These are the kind of understanding we need to quickly now build. You know, and uh, that is why I commend you for paying attention. You know, to this to this issue on this program this morning. A lot of this has to happen so that Nigerians can know, based on this knowledge and understanding, and say to their lawmakers, at least exercise that civic responsibility to say, look, uh, Mr. Senator, we do not want this to happen. You can go right. in there and do what you want to do, but it is on record that we have said this is what you should do. Right. Okay, uh, you are very correct with that regard. I mean, I was at one or two hearings here in Lagos. Um, I was um, at the hearing held by the senator um, representing Lagos East, uh, who was asking, you know, Lagosians. And many of them were actually clamoring for education. They were clamoring for infrastructure. They were clamoring for being held accountable, such lawmakers who are in office. But, you know, many of those are not part of what we are seeing being presented uh, for the over review and, of course, assent into law by the lawmakers. We thank you so much for joining us uh, on the program today, OK, Opia, who is, um, I hope I'm getting that, Ekpia, rather, who is um, an executive director of Order Paper. Thank you so much for being with us on News Hub today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I appreciate your contributions. Well, David, quite a lot for us um, to, to continue to look forward to as Nigeria emerges and grows in this democracy that we find ourselves. Yes, um, for me, I, I think um, if, we really, if we really must grow, we must uh, be intentional about it as a people. We, we must uh, be intentional to participate. Uh, but sadly, you heard um, Pia talk about the fact that, uh, I mean, I did say to him that, um, uh, the document right now that we have is skewed towards them intentionally disenfranchising the people from, from, from being involved. Uh, people are still struggling with fuel scarcity right now. If there was a, a hearing somewhere in Lagos <laughs> today, I'm sure the singular fact that people want to buy fuel in their cars would completely knock a lot of people out from attending. People are still struggling with having the basics, the basics of, existence, of existence, and then you, yeah. you're asking them to come and start <laughs> uh, looking at, you, you know, I mean, I'm not making an excuse, but that is what it is at the moment. If, if, if the people are, to an extent, uh, are comfortable in terms of their welfare, where they don't have to think about basics of life, you don't see, you now, you now see uh, attention now moved you know, a notch further. Let's begin to look at issues of who governs me, how I'm, I'm being governed, and not rather than thinking having of, how much they're having as pension. pension and all of that. You know, there's also a new provision for a maritime security trust fund, yeah. which will be created from one of the bills, allowing for even more finances to be pumped into the sector as they claim that you know the seas are at more risk of um, you know invaders and of course pirates so what is it? They, they have they really they have to come back home they have to come back to the people and hear mm. what the people can say we keep saying this in the business circle 
that government have no business doing business. Mm. If you make the climate, the environment uh, conducive, investors would come. Absolutely. This this business, this, this sectors will thrive. The aviation, the maritime, uh, the non-oil sector will thrive you if the right policies are there. You don't have to. to government it. don't have to. <laughs> I mean, what happens to the PPP arrangement? Mm. It, it's, it's it's a way to go in the global economy. Anyway, we'll see. we need to go now. Let's take this break. <laughs> we have more conversations uh, Absolutely. Uh, for, for you. We'll take this break. When we come back, we'll be looking at another, another conversation on the show uh, later. Stay with us.